All right, let's take a look at our homework from last night, page 185. You had a few problems to work and a few questions to answer. Questions 21 through 24 is where we will begin. Question number 21, uh, under what conditions is momentum conserved and under what conditions is it not conserved? And thank you, Kendall. Go ahead and read us your answer for 21. The conditions momentum is Good. In the absence of external forces, momentum is conserved. But if there are forces present that aren't canceling each other, so if net force is not, is not zero, then momentum will not be conserved. Number 22. How may the law of conservation of momentum for two interacting objects be stated algebraically? Audrey? Um, the law of conservation of momentum for two interacting objects can be stated algebraically as uh, m sub a b sub a plus m sub b b sub b equals m sub a b sub a prime plus m sub b b prime. Good. In other words, they were asking for the equation for conservation of momentum that I gave you in the last lesson. Good job, Audrey. Number 23, what's an elastic collision? What's an inelastic collision? What's a completely inelastic collision? And give examples of each. Um, let's start with Kendall. Just answer the first part and an example. What's an elastic collision? And give an example. Elastic collision is energy and motion transferring one object to another. And an example would be a baseball, a baseball and a bat. Hmm. That's actually a good example of an inelastic collision. Yet your definition was pretty good. Um, so you said kinetic energy transfers completely. There is no loss of kinetic energy in an elastic collision, but there is a loss of kinetic energy when a baseball hits a bat. Um, let's see, Audrey, how about an inelastic collision and an example? Um, an inelastic collision is total kinetic energy not conserved. Um, and then I have baseball and bat. There we go, that is an example of the inelastic. What do you have for your elastic collision? Um, I tried thinking of one in thinking rubber bands for elastic, but I know it's not collisions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know that the book actually gives you an example of one because they're so rare. At least, they're rare in the sense of what we'd be able to ever see. Um, you know, there are some texts, and the book even uses this as an example of one. They say, well, let's assume they collide elastically with a couple of billiard balls you know, colliding or something. That's not entirely the case either. Um, that's also technically inelastic, though it's close to elastic. We talked about those little silver balls that bounce back and forth. When they collide, they collide almost elastically, but not quite, as we'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, what's an ex uh, what is a completely inelastic collision? And give examples. Uh, I'll give an example there, Kendall. Okay, uh, so when bubblegum hits the floor, splat, it sticks to it. Uh, good. Uh, number 24, what quantities are conserved in an elastic collision? There's two of them. And what about in an inelastic collision? There's one of them. Again, assuming no external forces present uh, for these. Um, Audrey, what do you have for 24? Um, so the quantities that are conserved in an elastic collision are momentum and kinetic energy. Good. Um, so, or a quantity conserved in an inelastic collision uh, is the objects. I hmm. didn't quite find it. What do you have for the second part there, Kendall? Okay, in an elastic collision, the output kinetic energy is. Hmm. Yeah, momentum is conserved in the inelastic. Both, both momentum and kinetic energy conserved in the elastic collision. We'll talk about that here in just a bit. All right, let's go and review some things that we talked about in our last couple of lessons. We've been talking a lot about class energy. And energy, we said, Michael, is? Uh, a transfer of work. Mm, work is a transfer of energy. We would say energy is not a transfer of work, but the ability to do work. The ability to do work. There we go. Talked about a couple different types of energy. Uh, talked about kinetic energy. What's that, Kendall? Energy of motion, what your feet are doing right now there at the table. <laughs> um, uh, what about uh, potential energy? What's that? It's a little longer definition, Audrey. Um, energy is the potential energy that is. So kinetic energy is energy that is demonstrated by an object's motion, is evidenced by an object's motion. 
Um, potential energy. Michael? Kind of, that's a way to think of it. The energy an object acquires when it is exposed to a force. What is potential energy, Audrey? Um, um, what you said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did I say? Uh, something exposed to a force. Energy an object acquires, or the energy an object gets when it's exposed to a force. What is it, Michael? Energy an object gets when exposed. There we go. Energy and object acquires when it is exposed to a force. And then collectively, the kinetic energy and potential energy that an object has at any moment is referred to as that object's... Kendall? The sum of kinetic and potential energy of an object or a system. Audrey? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Mechanical energy. Good. Mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy. Yesterday we talked about momentum. We're going to work some problems involving momentum here in just a moment. And uh, we said momentum is what, Michael? It is the product of an object's mass and velocity. Good. The product of an object's mass and velocity, which gives us what equation for momentum, Kendall? P equals mv. Good. P equals mv. And um, we said what units will we use for momentum? Audrey? Kilograms times, because mm -hmm. mass is multiplied by kilograms times, mm -hmm. meters per second. There's not a fun unit to memorize. You just have to, you know, just think through what you got there. You got the M, the V, it's kilograms times meters per second. Um, we said that uh, momentum was something that was discussed, certainly implied with the discussion of inertia, but uh, actually originally when Newton formed his second law of motion, it wasn't F equals MA. The force is proportional to mass and desired acceleration. Uh, but rather that the force affects a time rate of change of momentum. So we said we could say that F equals the time rate of change in momentum. So F equals delta P over T. But I said if momentum changes, which quantity is likely to change, class? The velocity is likely to change. So I said that you can think of a change in momentum as anyone? M delta V. Because it's the V that's likely to change that changes the momentum. And that gave us this equation that force is equal to mass times a change in velocity over time. We could use this equation, change in momentum over time, but uh, mass times change in velocity over time is perhaps an easier way to think of it. And we had some problems involving uh, that equation. We also said that if there are no outside forces acting on a system, momentum will be conserved. And again, Audrey, you gave me that equation a moment ago. What was that equation for the conservation of momentum? Um, there we go. Momentum of one object plus the momentum of the other object is going to equal, after some interaction, the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object. Total momentum is conserved. And we had a couple equations or a couple problems using that. Problem number 11. Problem number 11 from the homework. Go ahead and read that problem for us, if you would, Michael. A bull with a mass of 4 kilograms and a speed of 5 meters per second runs head on into a parked automobile. If the automobile is this the onslaught with a force of 10 times 10 e3 newtons, how long does it take the car to stop the bull? All right. So um, several numbers that we are given here. Uh, first of all, we're given the mass of the bull, 400 point kilograms. We're given he was traveling at a speed of 5 meters per second. Now that's initially. So he said initial velocity could be the 5 meters per second. But ultimately, as the bull crashes into the car, eventually the bull will have to stop with a really bad headache. And so the final velocity we said would be 0 meters per second. And collectively, class, that gives us the change in velocity. What is the change in velocity? Negative 5 meters per second. By the way, mass times change in velocity collectively could give us a change in momentum if we wanted to approach it that way. What is the bull's change in momentum, anyone? Negative 
negative 2,000 kilograms times meters per second, right? You've got the negative 5 change in velocity times the mass. Remember, change in momentum is mass times change in velocity. Or you could say, what was his momentum? 2,000. What will be his momentum? Zero. What's the change? Negative 2,000. So three different ways you could approach the problem. But it says that the automobile, as it's sitting there parked, now again, that means there's, you know, uh, the built-in braking mechanism of the car when it's in park. So not, maybe the parking brake on as well. Uh, but the, the point is the car's not supposed to roll. So when the bull crashes into it, assuming the car doesn't just roll like it's in neutral, he kind of skids it along the ground, right? So it's really the friction force of the ground and the tires that's resisting the bull. It uh, resists his onslaught, is the word I believe it uses, uh, with a force of class... 1.0. 1, oh, so 1 E3 um, means basically a thousand newtons, but it resists the onslaught. Meaning if the bull's coming from this direction charging, the car is, the force, the frictional force of the car is against it. So we would notate the force class as negative a thousand newtons. And it is a negative force that would cause a negative change in momentum, right? If Michael's running and I come up behind, or maybe Michael's on roller skates, and I come up behind him and without knocking him down, I push Michael, he will speed up, right? My force will be causing his momentum to increase. But if he's rolling and I come against him and I apply a force, that would slow his momentum, correct? So the force has to be against the original motion to cause a negative change, which is perfect. Because if we take this equation, force equals change in momentum over time, or the time rate of change in momentum, Solving for the time, which is what it asks us to do. How do I get t by itself, class? Alternate. Alternate. I'm going to take the change in momentum, divide by the force. Time has to come out positive, right? You can't have negative time, right? Though, you know, time travel and time machines and stuff like that would be cool, but it doesn't work that way, right? So we have to have positive time. And so it works out great. We take the change in momentum of negative 2,000, divide by the force of negative 1,000. In class, we get positive 2 seconds. And of course, I think 3 sig figs throughout. So positive 2.00 seconds is the time needed. Do we have that answer, ladies? Michael questions. And again, you didn't have to use the change in momentum over time. You could have done mass times change in velocity over time and worked it that way as well. Uh, number 12. Oh, I didn't realize she had left the projector on. Okay, good, good. I don't need the projector. I was like, that beep means something just turned off. My camera's still on. The iPad's still on. Where do I know that beep from? Projector makes that noise. All right, we're good. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, number 12. Go ahead and read number 12 for us, if you would, Audrey. Um, what force must be con continuously applied for .5 seconds to stop a .5 kilogram ball going 31 meters per second. All right, so uh, you know what those little medicine balls are, right? The little, little bit squishy, heavy. Uh, well, this is a very small one. It only weighs one pound, okay? So usually the medicine ball is a little bit heavier. Just a little one-pound medicine ball. But Michael rears back and he chucks it at you 65 miles an hour. That's what we've got going on. Now, Audrey doesn't want to just put her hands there and catch it. Or maybe, since it's small enough, maybe she even has a softball glove. She doesn't want to just boom. She wants to give just a little bit, correct? All right, so she's gonna give just a little bit. So it's not going to instantly stop the moment it hits her hand. It's gonna take about a half a second to come to that complete stop. But the point is, she, even though she's letting her hand give, she's still applying a force in the opposite direction to cause the ball to stop. That's what we've got going on here. So we've got a uh, force that's applied for 0 0.50 seconds. Class, that's time half a second, we have a mass that is coming at her, <coughs> bless you, she's allergic to medicine balls being chucked at her. Uh, the mass of the medicine ball, 0.5 kilograms, and the ball had been going 31 meters per second, but we're stopping it. What's the change in velocity? Negative 31 meters per second. And it says what force is needed? What force must be applied? Well, remember, force is change in momentum or mass times change in velocity per unit time. Notice, mass is 0.5, time is 0.5. Thoughts? So what's the force? Negative 31. Now, the units don't cancel, though, right? We have kilograms times meters per second per second, which comes out to? 
Of course, measured in newtons. So negative 31 newtons must be applied for half a second to stop it. And that is two sig figs, so we are correct with the negative 31 newtons. Again, negative force because it's resisting the former, the former motion. It's diminishing the momentum. It's diminishing the energy of the ball. Um, did we get the negative 31 newtons? Did you type in the 0.5 times negative 31 divided by 0.5 and then be like, oh, duh? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. questions on that. All right, I was looking for shortcuts first. Uh, let's see, numero 13, oh, read that for us, Kendall. Let's see, we got a 14 kilogram object. I'm trying to picture what this would be. That's about 30 pounds. A 30 pound object. Bag of ice. 30 pound bag of ice. And it's skidding along an ice rink at a constant speed. And then an 8 kilogram object. Ah, here we go. Okay, so. Um, Let's just say we have to ignore friction, right? Friction can't exist here. So we've got a really nice smooth ice rink. And uh, we've got uh, um, Kendall and Audrey are at the ice rink. And Audrey, oh, she rushes. She takes 30 pound bag of ice and, oh, and sends it flying across the ice at 14 um, meters per second. Or, uh, excuse me, at 5 meters per second. Now, a little before her, Kendall, who is smaller, has taken an 8 kilogram bag of ice, which is still a pretty decent constant. And who slid it along the ground at three meters per second. So Audrey's is moving faster and Audrey's is bigger. So when Audrey's comes up behind, bump, what's going to happen to the uh, smaller bag of ice that was already sliding across the ice rink? It'll slide faster assuming it doesn't bust open, right? And what'll happen to Audrey's after it bumps? Assuming, yes, Audrey's would slow down. So that's kind of what we got going on here. So we have a 14 kilogram object going five meters per second. And we've also got an eight kilogram object going three meters per second. And they're going in the same direction. That's important because by going in the same direction, they both have the positive velocities. After bump happens, Audrey's uh, bag of ice is still 14 kilograms. Definitely did not plan on doing this with bags of ice, but whatever, here we go. Audrey's 14 kilogram bag of ice is still 14 kilograms. Kendall's eight kilogram bag of ice is still eight kilograms. But the formerly slowly moving three meter per second bag of ice is suddenly lurched forward by impact and is now going, Kendall? Um, nine. Nine meters per second. And uh, by the way, I assure you, Audrey had no ill will attending to bump. She wanted to get hers across the ice before yours. And unfortunately, yours was in the way. So you're now going to win because she just missed, okay? She wasn't like trying to destroy your bag of ice or anything. The question is, what is the velocity going to be of Audrey's bag of ice? Did we set it up this way? Mm. Questions. Uh, Kendall, good. Audrey, Michael, questions on why and how we set it up this way. All right, so now it's just a lot of math. Um, and my suggestion would be simplify everything you can as much as you can. So the 5 and 14 just make it a? Five, seven, 70. Seven. The 8 and 3 just make a? Five, I'm going to make this a 14 V sub A prime. And then 9 and 8? Now it looks a lot easier, right? We just combine, get rid of the 72, and divide away the 14. And whatever 22 divided by 14 is, that's our answer. Can it round it off? I think it was two sig figs in this problem, yes. So Audrey, how fast is your larger bag of ice going now that it bumps Kendall's? There we go. Now, it's still going forward after it bumps Kendall's, but it has lost a lot of its own momentum and a lot of its own energy, giving instead that energy to Kendall's bag of ice, which now wins, all because you didn't aim perfectly, right? All right, though she thinks, you know, that you did and you tried to, but you won. All right, questions on this? <laughs> and Kendall's like, I didn't even know it was a competition. I was just randomly setting a bag of ice across an ice rink. I don't even know why I did that. Strange things happen in physics class, okay? You never know what's going to happen. 
All right. <laughs> it's okay. I was about to uh, volunteer my, my uh, third born to be the 30 pound object. <laughs> Oh, anyway, but Timmy would, or Andy wouldn't have been a good eight, eight or seventeen pound object. Anyway, uh, number fourteen, number fourteen. Here we go. It is a big gun. So we are not talking about like a rifle here, okay? We're talking about an artillery piece, a howitzer. All right, you field artillery here. And go ahead and read number fourteen for us, Michael. A two hundred forty kilogram gun fires a point one kilogram shell with a muzzle velocity of six hundred and ten meters per second. If the gun is free, move what is its recoil velocity? I say, I say, artillery piece, a point one kilogram shell, and that's small. You remember those little masses we were using the other day? That's that's the hundred gram mass. That's that's actually rather small. So this is this is this is no large artillery piece. I don't know what we've got going on here, but it's fired really fast. Okay, so anyway, um, the point is before now again, if the, it says if the gun is free to move, and by the way, the guns. Have you ever seen the movies of the old, you know, the, the artillery pieces in World War One, World War Two, Korean War, and stuff, where there's built-in recoil, so the actual gun doesn't necessarily have to move. Um, you may have noticed in some of them, though, you'll even see the gun actually roll backward just a little bit. So assuming there's no friction whatsoever, so the gun can slide backward or whatever, all on its own, what happens? Well, let's start with the mass of the gun class. 240 kilograms. And uh, initially, it's just sitting there. So initially, its velocity is zero. We also have the shell that has a mass of... And again, its velocity before firing is zero. It's just sitting there also. So this whole side just becomes zero. No big deal. Then we have the 240 kilogram gun, and it's going to fire the, bolt, the uh, shell, and it recoils. We don't know what that velocity is. And then we've got the shell, still 0.1 kilograms, but we know how fast it goes. 610 meters per second. And uh, so there we go. We have a 240 V sub A prime. What is 0.1 times 610? 61. We'll subtract the 61, divide the 240, and that'll give us the recoil. So subtract 61 to get a negative 61, divide the 240. And what is the recoil velocity of the gun? Negative 354. Negative 0.254, blah, 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 or round it off. It is two C figs. Negative 0.25 meters per second. And there we go, questions on number 14. All right, any questions on momentum, conservation of momentum, all of that stuff? Change of momentum, force causing the change in momentum per unit time. Really, these are the two big things we were working on, questions on those. All right, let's talk about collisions then. That was what your homework reading was all about. Talking about collisions, different types of collisions based on what quantities are conserved. Now again, with all of these, we have to assume no outside forces, right? For instance, um, when Timmy and I play tackle, because I was, I was watching the Colts the other day on Monday Night Football, and I was like, you know what? I'll let my son stay up for you know, a couple of drives and just watch some Colts football with me. And so we're watching Colts Steelers, which was a pretty ugly game anyway. And uh, the Colts are missing one tackle after the other, and I can't handle it anymore, so I'm finally like, son, let me teach you how to tackle properly, because this is awful what's going on there. So I teach him how to tackle, that's his favorite game now, is Tackle Daddy. And so I'll get, I have to get down on my knees, though, because otherwise, you know, he's just way down there. So I get down on my knees and, you know, Tackle Daddy and practice for him, you know, full contact, wrap, turn your head, you know, so you don't lead with the crown of the head, all those things. You know, safety is always a concern. But anyway, collisions. Well, in those collisions, obviously, there's a lot of friction. He's not sliding me along the floor. But imagine somehow we were on ice rink with no friction at all. Okay, really nice smooth ice rink, and I'm just kind of kneeling there. And when he hits me, I am free to move somehow. Um, so we have to assume a lot of things here for these collisions to be exactly right. We're assuming these outside forces aren't present. But if that's the case, a few different types of collisions. And the first type of collision is called an elastic collision. An elastic collision. Now, the idea here of elastic is not like stretching out a rubber band, but more like a rubber ball bouncing. The idea is that things just bounce off very readily. Now, the key to an elastic collision is complete bounce off, if you will. And if that's true and complete bounce off, if you will, on the collision, 
then there's absolutely no loss of energy. That's what defines the elastic collision, is no lost kinetic energy. Now, momentum, of course, will also be conserved if there's no outside forces. So we also have no lost momentum. Both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved in what's called an elastic collision. Now, in the case of a bouncing rubber ball, picture it now. I bounce the rubber ball on the floor. If you could take a picture right as the rubber ball hits the floor, what happens? Are you all right? Yeah. See a tissue? Mm -hmm. Okay. At first I thought you were going back to the trash. I'm like, oh no. Okay. <laughs> um, so what, what happens? I'm sorry. Right as it hits the floor, what happens? It it's going to compress in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, you just lost energy by the compression. Deformation has occurred, which has used some of that energy, right? Negative work was done by the floor in causing deformation. We've lost energy. Um, also, you'll hear a sound. Well, sound is a transfer of energy through a wave. If there's sound, it's not elastic. If there's some friction that's produced right at that point, heat might be produced. Now, a small amount, granted, but some heat might be produced, right? Uh, you ever, you maybe more so than the ladies, because girls don't play stupid games like guys do in high school. You ever just randomly go slap somebody in the back of the neck? Yeah, you've done that before? Yeah. Well, after you get slapped in the neck, or after you do the slapping, your hand feels warmer or the back of your neck feels warmer, depending on whether you're the slapper or the slappy, right? We don't actually advocate or recommend these things. As you know, you could potentially dislocate a vertebrae and cause problems for a person's health later. But that's thermal energy that is now being dissipated right into the atmosphere. So that's not an elastic collision either. So for no lost kinetic energy to be there, no sound, no heat, no compression, no, nothing converted into potential energy. All kinetic energy stays energy of motion. You get the idea, we're not going to see a whole lot of collisions like this, because nearly any collision we can see would make some sound. But there are collisions going on around us constantly. We don't see them, we don't hear them, they don't give off thermal energy, and no energy is lost. Constant motion all around and collisions all around. Do you know what I'm talking about? Atoms and molecules bump, bumping into air, air pressure, right? Is this bombardment of molecules. You don't hear any sound. Can you imagine if you did? How loud this world would be if you heard every collision of air, air molecules? So the atoms and molecules of gases and stuff like that, they collide elastically. Now, it is true. You can with some collisions, like for instance, <clears throat> Newton's uh, little, the little silver ball thingies that bounce up against each other. Those collisions are nearly elastic. There is not really any compression in those metal balls. The sound energy that is lost is minimal, admittedly. Um, if there's thermal energy produced, it's a minuscule amount. You can practically say you have an elastic collision, but in reality, it's not perfectly elastic. If no kinetic energy is lost, looking at page, uh, page 182, looking at page 182 with me, if no kinetic energy is lost, then look at the bottom of page 182 at uh, equation 27. That would show a conservation of kinetic energy. That's a pretty straightforward equation. You could have deduced that yourself, right? Half MAV A uh, squared plus a half MVVB squared. And then you've got the same thing, right? But momentum is also conserved. So that means the MAVA plus MVVB, the, this equation is also in play. And if we have two equations solved together, that creates what's called a system of equations, right? Where we can solve independently for variables. And using systems of equations, if you wanted to solve for the velocity of the first object after the collision, you'd use equation 28. If you want to solve for the um, uh, velocity of the second object, you would use equation 29. So you'd have to use two different equations to calculate new velocities. Both of those equations are annoyingly long. In reality, no collision is perfectly elastic. So for your sake, I'm not going to make you memorize those equations. Merry Christmas. You're welcome, Kevin. Equation 28 and 29. Now, they work an example problem for you, and you can see how you could plug in the different numbers and stuff there. Um, and again, two bowling balls colliding. There's not going to be much compression, minimal sound, minimal friction, so minimal heat, but technically not a perfect elastic collision.
So we're not gonna actually worry about elastic collisions in this class. You may look at it more in college, but for our purposes, we're gonna kind of ignore the elastic collisions. Just know that what makes a collision elastic class is no lost, lost kinetic energy or momentum. Both of these are conserved, and that's usually the way that you'll see it worded. A collision in which both kinetic energy and momentum are conserved would be an elastic collision. Now, an inelastic collision is one in which there is some loss of kinetic energy. But for our purposes, we will still assume momentum is conserved. Conserved, I can't spell. Momentum is still conserved, but kinetic energy is lost. Some kinetic energy is transferred into either sound, heat, potential energy. There's some compression that takes place or deformation that occurs. For instance, a ball hitting a bat, right? It even has the picture there. It says right next to the picture, an inelastic collision. Uh, why? Because sound is given off, right? Some friction, some heat is giving off. Some deformation occurs. Um, Audrey and Kendall, you were both in my PE class. You might recall every now and then after one of the guys in the PE class especially maybe got a really good hit. And I get the ball back, I'm like, oh, it's all upside. Give me a new softball, right? Because a really good hit can deform a softball. And baseballs and stuff like that, every time a baseball is touched by a bat, or even if it hits the ground on a pitch, anything other than leather to leather, right here, or hand to leather, they'll get a new baseball. You watch baseball games and see them changing out baseballs constantly. Why? Because a little bit of deformation occurs and the ball does funny things. Now, I will say, there are times where I like the deformed softball at PE because when you're pitching a ball slow, a little deformation can help the ball to do strange things. Like, I could aim the ball at the batter and it goes across the plate. I could aim at the plate and the ball goes over there. And uh, because the ball actually curves in its flight with the deformation, it's great fun. But they don't want that happening in a baseball game, okay? Um, they want to know what the ball's going to do. They need the pitcher to know what the ball's going to do because if you got plunked by a baseball at 95 miles an hour, it's a lot different than getting hit by a softball, you know, two miles. Okay, it's not that slow. Um, so an uh, inelastic collision, this is most of, the uh, most of the collisions that we would encounter on a day-to-day -day situation. Now again, for our purposes, we're going to have to assume no outside forces, which is how and why momentum is conserved. And okay, a lot of collisions, there are other outside forces at play. But as far as we're concerned, most of the collisions that we will deal with in this class, we're going to assume the perfect world, no outside forces, they're going to be inelastic collisions. So. All you have to know is the law of conservation of momentum. We don't have to keep up with the kinetic energy. By the way, quick thought, going back to the inelastic collisions. Why is it important that um, gas molecule, gas atom collisions be completely elastic? If there was heat, it would be good. Okay, it would get very hot if there was heat given off, yes. It would be very loud if sound was given off. If they lost a little bit of kinetic energy, Imagine it, right? They're bumping around, bumping around, bumping around, and they lose a little bit of kinetic energy every time they bump into something, even if it's just a small amount. If some of that energy of motion is lost, eventually where would all the atoms and molecules end up? Sitting on the floor, right? We couldn't breathe. I right, like go down to the floor and breathe, you know, kind of like a whale coming up to the surface, right? So it's important that those, now again, there is more dense lower down because gravity does pull it down. There is that outside force present of gravity. The air does have weight. But still, they're at least bouncing around constantly. So as they hit the table, it's not just going to stay down here. No, they just keep moving, constantly moving. And so that's very important for us to be able to breathe. All right, the final type of collision is one that is completely inelastic. Now, elastic has the idea of bouncing off, right? Inelastic has the idea of not quite bouncing off perfectly. But completely inelastic would mean it doesn't bounce off at all. This would be my son tackling, right? If he wraps up, he hits, and he doesn't bounce off, he stays with me. Now, as one, we go down to the ground. Or as one, I just hug him for a second. Whatever, right? This would not be what the Colts players were doing when I had to teach him that. They were hitting and bouncing off, and the runner kept going over and over again. In a completely inelastic collision, the objects stick together. The objects stick together. So, for instance, the example one student gave, and I don't remember who it was, about the gum hitting the floor. Gum hits the floor, slap, and it stays there, right? Or imagine for a moment, um, I don't know, you're on a, uh, you know, a roller coaster or something, and the person in the front is chewing their gum, right? And, ah! and when they open their mouth to scream, the gum flies out and splat, hits you in the forehead. 
right? And it sticks, completely an elastic collision, right? Uh, my sister one time was riding her bike and there was a bird sitting on a telephone line. You know where this is going, right? And she's just riding her bike, minding her own business and the bird is taking care of his and uh, just happened to time it perfectly where it slap right on her hand. Well, that was a completely inelastic collision. Bird remained as a byproduct, if you will, excrement, and a sister traveling as one down the road, right? They're now moving as a unit. Um, the gum and your forehead are moving as a unit. Um, uh, if, um, I don't know, you're driving down the road and somebody tosses like a plastic, you shouldn't do this, it's littering, right? It's bad. But they toss a plastic bag out the window, it hits your windshield and stays there, or some sort of trash or whatever blows up and it sticks to the front of the car. Ever seen that happen? Um, and, uh, okay, it travels as one now, right? Uh, I think of, for instance, um, uh, Calvin and Hobbes. You familiar with Calvin and Hobbes cartoons? Mm -hmm. Comic strip? Love Calvin and Hobbes, you're missing out. Um, I wouldn't recommend letting young children read it, though. They get bad ideas. Only mature audiences <laughs> who understand the foolishness of children and how dangerous it can be. Uh, but anyway, he's a goofy little kid, has a stuffed tiger, pretends they play together. Well, anyway, okay, let's say he chucks a snowball and hits, hits Hobbs, and it sticks to Hobbs. Okay? And they're running. Travel is one. Completely inelastic collision. Uh, two cars, if they lock fenders or bumpers when they collide, and now they're traveling as one. That would be an example of a completely inelastic collision where the objects stick together. Now, we still have to assume no outside forces, right? So in the case of the car and the car, assuming they're on an icy road and they collide and stick, okay? If that's the case, there was a momentum that the first car had, there was a momentum that the second car had, meaning a mass and velocity of the first, mass and velocity of the second. After impact, though, there is only one object now. Right? And that one object had, is the combined mass of the other two, minus whatever parts of the cars fell off, right? Or fragments of snow that may have fallen off of Hobbes. And they travel with one singular final velocity. It's really the same equation. We're just combining this into one quantity now, recognizing that these two velocities are the same, so they could then be factored out as one. It's really not a new equation, it's just a derivation on an old equation. So these are your three types of collisions. Most collisions, again, for our purposes class, we will assume to be inelastic. If the objects stick, completely. completely inelastic, and only really with atoms and molecules is kinetic energy also conserved as well as momentum, in which case we have elastic, elastic collisions. Look at the example problem at the top of page 183. Go ahead and read that. Speaking of uh, automobile crashes, go ahead and read that for us, Kendall. Now again, assuming they're driving on normal roads, you cannot neglect friction, okay? Both people probably would normally, right? If somehow you're driving down the road, you're like, oh my goodness, he's about to hit me. And they're kind of like, oh my goodness, I'm about to hit them. Probably both of you slam on the brakes, right? So both of you are kind of skidding instead of even rolling at this point. And even once you do hit, by then surely you're trying to engage the brake in some form or fashion. So friction's going to play a role. But... Assuming somehow, a little bit of an icy road, nobody hits the brake because nobody sees it coming, and um, maybe the one car somehow shifts into neutral, or the, both cars right at the collision somehow shift into neutral. I don't know, maybe this is a crash test they're doing at the, um, at the manufacturing plant to test the safety of the automobile. I don't know, but this is what we've got going on. Hopefully no one was harmed in the writing of this problem. Um, so we got two objects, right? We have the first object, first car has a mass of... 1,200 kilograms, and it was traveling at a rate of 30 meters per second. The second vehicle was has a mass of, so it's a bigger one, so maybe a small sedan, large sedan, or a large sedan crossover, small SUV, large SUV, I don't really know. And uh, the second one was traveling at, but it's a head-on collision, right? Which means one vehicle's coming this way, one vehicle's going that way. One of those velocities has to be negative. Which one do you want to be negative, Kendall? Um, let's do the 30. The 30. Okay, so the smaller vehicle is the, is the negative. 
and the larger vehicles, the positive. The upside to that is, who's gonna win a head-on collision? I mean, nobody wins, obviously, if there's, there's people in it. But again, we're, let's just assume this is crash test. There's crash dummies in there, all right? And so they crash, and who's gonna win? The bigger vehicle's gonna win, right? So by making the bigger vehicle that was moving with greater momentum to begin with, making that positive, means that when it's all said and done, we're still gonna have a positive. Had Kendall chosen the negative for the 35, the negative would have been our final answer, right? Which is actually what the book did. So the book's answer will be the inverse of what we said. All right, now, they collide and they are now stuck together. Again, we call that class A. Completely inelastic Completely collision, good Audrey. So now they are one object with a mass of 2,800 kilograms and they are traveling with, well, I don't know what velocity. That's what we need to find. So let's go and simplify it a step at a time. 1,200 times negative 30. 36,000. Negative 36,000. And uh, 1,600 times 35. 56,000. Positive 56,000 equals a 2,800 V sub F. Well, let's combine the negative 36,000 with the positive 56,000. 20,000. And then divide away the 2,800, or divide 200 by 28, if you're lazy. And uh, we get 7.1, it didn't come out even like 0.14, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but we're rounding off, I think, to two sig figs anyway, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. so rounding off, we'd say the final velocity is... So after the collision, the smaller car which was going this way, larger car this way, for instance, after the collision, they're now locked together, but they're now moving slowly backwards. Well, this car's moving forward. The smaller car is now moving backwards, being displaced by the larger vehicle that had more momentum to start with. Questions on this? Again, the book has the negative 7.1 meters per second because it assumed that the first car was positive and the second car was negative, which obviously just changes all the sign conventions throughout. Questions on completely inelastic collisions. All right, turn over to page 185. Page 185. And uh, we're going to skip over number 15, which is billiard balls colliding elastically, which, again, it's pretty close, honestly. I mean, again, it's, it's pretty close to elastic. By the time you round a sig fix, it probably works out. But we're going to skip over it because we're not doing elastic collisions in this class for your sake. Let's go to 16 and uh, read this one for us, Audrey. Uh, 426 grams snowball flying at 15 meters per second has a 12.2 kilograms above directly from behind and sticks to the sled. A, what is the final velocity of the sled if initially it was going along level ground at 6 meters per second? What is the final velocity of the sled if the snowball hits the sled from the opposite direction, its north friction? All right, ignoring friction means momentum is conserved, right? Assuming it's not a perfectly elastic collision, the key here is it sticks. If it sticks to the sled, we know we've got completely inelastic. So we're going to take the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object. That's going to equal the combined mass times the final velocity. All right, so the mass of the first object. Ooh, 0.426 kilograms. 9.426 kilograms is the mass of the first object. Here we go. Um, and it was traveling at 15 meters, per second. 15 meters per second. The sled. Uh, and uh, it was traveling. It was traveling six meters per second. And it says that in part A, so we're solving part A here. Um, now it says it hits it from behind. Picture it. There's a sled going along the ground. We don't know if there's a person on the sled. Maybe it's just a sled going along the ground. And somebody's like, bam, Chuck hit that sled. And they hit the sled with the snowball. I don't know. Anyway, six meters per second uh, traveling along the ground. It gets hit from behind. Snowball and sled going together or opposite? They get hit from behind. You're going together. So both of these are positive because they're both going in the same direction. The combined mass here, class. Mm. 12.626 kilograms. 
at your seats, find how fast the sled will go once it gets hit by the snowball. Michael? 6.303. Yeah, 6.303, blah, blah, blah. Round it off, we'll say it's going about 6.3 meters per second. Now, it was already going 6, right? The snowball didn't speed it up much, admittedly. About a little bit of extra momentum from the backside there. Questions on letter A. All right, let's take a look at letter B. And really only one change we need to make here on letter B um, it says, what if, the, what if the snowball hits the sled from the opposite direction? So the sled's going along minding its own business, and bam, right in the face of this riderless sled, a snowball hits it. What's the only thing we need to change with the math here? We're going to make it a negative 15, which makes this a negative 6.39, which means, what's the combined momentum starting out? All right, and then we can divide that by the combined mass. And what is the final velocity? 5.291, blah, 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 round it off, 5.3. Here's my, I think it's interesting here to note that when the snowball hits from behind, it only increases the speed about 3 tenths of a meter per second, right? When it hits it from the face, it slows it down by about 0.7 meters per second. Why? Because additional mass is already going to slow things down, isn't it? It's not much mass, admittedly, but additional mass is going to slow things down. So when you're hitting the face, you've got an extra mass to carry, plus you have the slowdown effect of the momentum hitting you. From the back, you've got that jolt, but it's diminished by the fact that you're now carrying extra mass. So it's not going to be equal whether you hit from one side or the other. You are hurt more than you are helped, depending on the way in which you are hit. Of course, either way, you're like, ah, oh, you hit me with a snowball, and then it starts a snowball fight. It's great fun. Unless you hit in the eye by a snowball. But, you know, these things happen. All right, questions on these types of collisions. All right, we'll review more of that in our next lesson together. For homework this evening, I need you to read just two pages and answer just two questions. I need you to read two pages and answer two questions. Read pages 183 to 184. If you would, read pages 183 to 184. And on page 185, answer questions 25 and 27. Tomorrow we'll be finishing up the last of our material for the semester, and we'll be spending some time reviewing over the next uh, couple of lessons before your exam. Any questions on what we talked about today? All right, have a wonderful rest of your day. When the bell rings, you'll be dismissed.